Evening everyone. So I thought we would discuss the end of the Tory party here. I'm not suggesting uh, that it is coming or definitely coming or even likely to come. However, the end of the Conservative Party is something that, um, you know, some Conservatives believe may happen and it could happen. So it's worth just having a look at what's happened and what might cause it to happen, what circumstances have to happen, what events have to happen. I don't know why I've got my headphones on. <laughs> I don't need those. Um, what we need, what may need to happen um, to make it. Now, I just want to point out, because a lot of people will look at um, and, and think to themselves, and I have, I've said in the past that I can't see the Conservative Party actually going to the wall because... First of all, there's too much money behind it. They are the only party that represents the billionaires and the billionaires. The billionaires can donate a few million at a time or we're not even always billionaires, sometimes just people that are, from our point of view, it's the same thing as a billionaire. You know, they might have hundreds of millions of pounds worth of assets and, and other wealth. And they're, um, so they donate a few, you know, you get 10 of those to donate 3 million pounds each. That's 30 million quid. That is a tasty little kitty. And then you build it up with other donations as well. So you think, how can the Conservative Party go to the wall? It's not even like there's a new kid on the block. You look at Reform UK, but Reform UK don't look like they're going to challenge um, in anything. And even in the next generation, it would be hard to see Reform UK being on a trajectory to taking over as the main right-wing party, right? That being said, in a sense, it doesn't matter how much money there is to prop up the Conservative Party. If they do not even get the basics of politics right, they cannot win elections. You know, we're often used to saying that whoever spends the most tends to win. They certainly give themselves a massive advantage. But that is based on the idea that all of the various players will be playing the game well. There's no reason why even a small political party cannot access good quality strategic advice uh, and have access to good quality polling, for example, as long as they've got the money to do that. Um, the Conservatives are just massively getting it wrong. But I do want to point out that these things are possible. So I've got some dates up. I've put some dates up. In the last 200 odd years, since we've had what you might call anything close to democratic elections, obviously our parliament goes back a very long time. But you know, if you talk about the UK, the United Kingdom, as, as it, not quite as it is now, because uh, it was Great Britain and Ireland, then now it's Great Britain and Northern Ireland. But the UK with, with the union flag and all the rest of it. So what are the political parties that have dominated Westminster in that time? Because at the moment, a lot of people will say, well, it's Labour and it's the Conservatives, Labour and the Conservatives, and that is the hegemony at the moment. Hasn't always been that way. There have been five major parties in that time, in the, in the sort of history of the UK, and uh, or the history of the UK as it approximately is now. The Tory party, I mean, we often say, talk about the Tories, and I'll say the Tory party. I've actually used the word for Tory party at the start of the, t uh, the, the stream, and I don't mean that. <laughs> because the Tory party uh, no longer exists. But it's not that it just died and then the Conservative Party came to being. The, to the Conservative Party was born from the Tory party, um, which is why many of them still call themselves Tories. But nonetheless, the, the Tory party won an election in 1802. They won their last one in 1830. Uh, you know, and, and because they were run by, at the time, a military genius, but a political idiot, Sir Arthur Wellesley, the first Duke of Wellington, um, he destroyed the party. So something else emerged. It was the Conservative Party and they won. They formed a government for the first time in 1832. So we're, you know, that's why the Conservative Party at the moment will generally call it about 200 years old. Then you had the Whig Party. So it was Tories and Whigs. They used to change places in government. You generally had a Tory government or you had a Whig government. The Whigs, no one knows about them anymore. They've died out. They won their last election in 1857. That's the last time they formed a government. They had a government still for a few years later, of course. You don't have elections every year. But that was the last time they were able to form a government. 
And then again, you know, the party didn't just completely disappear. You know, remnants of it formed something else. You ended up with the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party first formed a government in 1859. And the last time they formed a government was in 1906. 1906 was an absolutely cracking year for them and a terrible year for the Conservative Party. 1906 is the biggest defeat that the Conservative Party have suffered in, in like practical terms ever. Uh, but then that was also the liberal, the last liberal government, really. I mean, there were, there's, there's often been sort of various like combinations. It's not the last time they were in government, but the last time they could form one. Um, you know, and then you had Labour first forming a sort of government. It wasn't a full Labour, you know, but they first formed a government in 1931. So we've now got the Conservatives and Labour going. But people mustn't think, oh, it's always been Labour and the Conservatives. It absolutely hasn't absolutely hasn't so it is entirely possible for a party it is possible for the conservative party to to be obliterated um i would i would just point out that that doesn't mean hooray there's no more right wing because you might think to yourself in terms of the current situation oh so now it could be labor and the lib dems oh well that's okay you've got a center left party and a centrist party okay yeah we can live with that we can live with that nothing will be too terrible then no, because the right wing still exists and it still has a lot of money and it still has a lot of organisation. And if the Conservative Party cannot sustain an electoral strategy, if they cannot show that they are going to be able to win power again, something else will emerge. You know, so when Conservatives talk about the Conservative Party will split, that's much more likely than the Conservative Party dying out as completely. Because there are a lot of voters who, you know, um, agree with many of their core values. It's just at the moment they are not pursuing their core values. At the moment, they are producing very high taxes. Um, public service. No one wants terrible public services. Not even most conservative voters want terrible public services. Yes, many of them agree that privatised services are better, but they still want them to work. They still want them to be accessible. And it's not working. They want uh, a government that's very pro-business, but the Conservative government have actually destroyed businesses with Brexit. It's, a, it's an anti-Brexit policy, and they knew it at the time. Remember, Boris Johnson's famous words, F Brexit. F asterisk, 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 Brexit. Uh, businesses, sorry. I wish he had said F Brexit. <laughs> Unfortunately, he didn't know. He said F business. Um, but there we go. I'll catch up with some comments before we go on to a few other uh, aspects of interest. Why does the left split votes more than the right? So the common explanation for that is that the left wing are very principled. Um, they are interested in the common good and everyone has an idea about what is best for the common good. Whereas the right wing, the principle is power. Ultimately, what drives many people on the right is power itself. So they are often much more focused on it at the moment they are clearly not because I mean, think about where the conservative party are now they've never had this in their history by the way what i'm going to describe for this election 2024 they have never experienced this in their 192 year history it's never happened to them before they are going to get squeezed on both flanks they're getting squeezed in the center they're getting squeezed on the right. And that's never happened before. Now, you may think back, hang on, Phil, in 2015, UKIP were very much squeezing them on the right. That is absolutely true. But they were not being squeezed in the centre because of two things. First, Labour, let's be honest, didn't run a good campaign and they didn't have a good build up either. So the campaign wasn't good at all, but the build up wasn't good either. Right. They hadn't, you know, deciding to go along with, oh, sorry, austerity is awful. Yeah, yeah. Terrible. Um, so they weren't. Be and the Liberal Democrats weren't squeezing them in the centre because Liberal Demo a lot of Liberal Democrat voters abandoned the Lib Dems in 2015, blaming them for their role in austerity. So the Conservatives were being squeezed on the right, but they were not being squeezed in the centre in 2019. It was a sort of nothing and half. 
Again, they weren't being squeezed in the centre by either Labour or the Liberal Democrats. Uh, Labour weren't even trying to capture the centre. It wasn't just incompetence. They weren't even attempting to capture the centre. The Liberal Democrats at the time were run by, um, well, let's face facts and idiots. Let's be honest. So the Liberal Democrats made no impact either. So again, the Conservatives were not being squeezed in the centre. Now, they were only half being squeezed on the right as well because the Brexit party stood down candidates in every seat that the Conservatives won in 2017. But they did stand against them in every other seat. So they were being squeezed on the right um, in many seats. And, and as devastating as 2019 was for Labour, the fact that the Brexit party stood candidates in non-Tory seats helped Labour retain not only, I reckon, somewhere between 20 and 30 seats, but, I mean, Yvette Cooper, for example, Yvette Cooper would be gone. That'd be it, she'd be finished. I mean, she may have come back since via a by-election, um, but, you know, she wouldn't have won her seat at the time. Um, so, yeah, it, it's... It, but the Conservatives mostly, mostly do focus on power. And there are some Conservatives who think, uh, I don't mean within the party necessarily, although there will be some of these. There are some Conservative voters, should we say, who are known. Because, you know, various polls take place, sometimes focus polls, focus groups where you can get more detailed answers. And there are some Conservatives who will say things like they could just do with a period in opposition. And the reason they'll say that is because they're not scared of Starmer. They're not scared of Labour um, anymore. And they're just looking at the Conservative Party and going, you're actually bad for business. And you're clearly disunited. You need a period in opposition to sort yourselves out. And they think that's what will happen. I am not so sure. They may, as long as they... For me, it depends what state they're in. It depends what state they're in. Now, if we look at what the latest polling says the state they'll be in really quickly... So this is the latest YouGov poll. Now, I will keep using YouGov as my main thing because um, not only have they got an excellent track record in the last couple of general elections, one of only two, but there, there are certain errors that creep into polling that I know YouGov are aware of and therefore much, much less like to make. One is false recall. I've talked about that before where when you're asking people how they voted in the last election, they tell you, but they may not tell you correctly, not because they're lying, but because they've genuinely forgot. Because it's surprising, it sounds surprising that you can, how can you forget who you voted for? Some people, it's like a toss of a coin who they're going to vote for. So, and usually what you find is with false recall is when you're asked a few years later who you voted for, if you voted for the party that's now really unpopular, you're more likely, and you're not lying, your brain just kids you. It lies to you. Your, your, your brain is lying to you. It makes you think you voted someone else because you'd be too embarrassing to have said you voted Tory. If if you're one of those people who just decided on the day, you weren't sure, you weren't sure, you weren't sure, you decided on the day and you voted Conservative. Well, a few years later, your brain might convince you. I know you didn't vote Conservative. You're not that stupid. So, uh, and the reason you could know this is because they do research. They've asked people how they voted straight away after elections within the first couple of weeks where of course they are going to remember and then they've asked the same people a few years later because they do online polling so they've got your you know you, as long as you stay registered with them they've got your details um they ask them a few years later and find that all and it's a lot it's not like a few percent by the way it's tens of percent it's a lot of people just forget who they voted for so that isn't taken account of by most pollsters because they haven't got the means to do it. A new, a newish pollster hasn't got the means to do that. And older ones don't either. Um, and then there's a few other things that, that YouGov deal with as well. Because of that false recall, a lot of people uh, think the Conservatives are going to do better than they are because they're not taking account of the fact that, that, that fewer people... Because to try and explain it... Um, Pollsters get their sample and they'll ask, who do you vote for, Conservative or Labour or Lib Dem or SNP or whatever, who you voted for? And because they know 43% voted Conservative, so the ones who say they voted Conservative, they, you know, they, okay, so you're part of the 43%. Well, 
What they don't realise is there's a load of people saying they voted Lib Dem or Labour or SNP maybe who actually voted Conservative. So they're putting those votes in the wrong parties. And what it does is it puts extra weight on the ones who said they voted Conservative. So it's um, whereas YouGov can take account of that. Other pollsters, Ipsos, I think, do a little bit as well, but I'm not. But, but YouGov are explicitly clear that they understand this. So that's why I use YouGovs um, mostly. And the latest poll, there has been a substantial narrowing, a huge narrowing, in fact, if you look at it. And yet it still puts the Conservatives on 90 seats. This map I've got above me is a change map on electoral calculus. Um, so all the grey areas are the ones that would remain as they are now. And uh, obviously the Northern Ireland is completely greyed out because I've, this is not really included. Um, I don't think this includes the Northern Ireland parties anyway. So we'll just look focus on Britain. Uh, so where you've got different colours there, it's where it's expected to change hands. And you can see that Labour and the Liberal Democrats look likely to flip a lot of seats between them. And it's Conservatives nowhere. There's no, there's no blue in there. So they're not going to win new seats and they're going to lose a hell of a lot of old ones. A hell of a lot. But anyway, I'll catch up with some more comments before we do other bits. Uh, Tory's worst defeat was after Bonnie Prince Charlie. Um, I'm going to electoral. I'm, I'm talking about, you know, since, since the UK formed. Technically, that was, it was the UK, Bonnie Prince Charlie, but it was before the UK as it is. We're talking about Union flag as it is now, shall we say. That sort of period of the UK. But it was Great Britain and Ireland. Now it's Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Uh, is electoral reform or media reform the most important for Labour to act on before the Tories return as a threat? I would say definitely. But I would also say if you had electoral, if you wanted to prioritise one, if you had electoral reform, a lot of other... Because you could easily write a list of two dozen really important things. The country is so broken that there are the it's almost like it needs rebuilding from the ground up. Now, realistically, you can't do that. Um, that only happens after like a catastrophic war, and we don't want that. Um, so, if you have one thing, it would be electoral reform, because if you end up with Parliament being a much closer representation of the population, the voting population, you will get a lot of those things naturally occurring. A lot of the reason, for example, why Labour have to adopt certain policies is not because they believe they are the best policies. Um, they are constraining themselves to an extent in order to win votes. And it's because if they don't, they're allowing more Conservative MPs to win or conservative candidates to win their seats and become conservative MPs. Whereas if you have a more proportionate system, then you don't have to do that as much. You you can focus more on your base. You, you can't just ever focus on your base, but you'll be able to focus more on your base. You'll be able to ignore some of the some of the voters that are really important now all of a sudden are less important to Labour. Um, so uh, and that also means that you can get you can get bet other reforms. Media reform is much safer then. It's much safer to instigate media reform after electoral reform. That being said, I also think there needs to be a focus on media reform early rather than later. But I imagine you, you can't just have a, a vision in mind of what would make a good media landscape and do it because the growing pains would be horrendous. Um, and it could be politically catastrophic. So you would have to chip away, I think. You'd have to sort of corral it. I think you would focus, first of all, on what is the issue with GB News. Uh, ultimately, the issue with GB News is it's not following the broadcast rules. So I think you would start with that. You would beef up Ofcom and you would insist there are no exceptions. These are the rules. People will follow them. And if they don't follow them, you will punish them in a way that stops them repeating the behaviour. Because if they repeat the behaviour, your punishment was crap. So Labour also need to give them some teeth. So you focus on broadcast media first, because most of the broadcast media follow the rules anyway. You're only pissing off GB News. Labour aren't chasing after the, their viewers, let's be honest. 
but then you would need to deal with um like the printed news media which followed completely different rules the rules for broadcast news completely different to a newspaper and they probably shouldn't be so then you would have to do that that would be more difficult but i think you would start um more quick uh, it says uh SNP predicted to win 18 seats or a lot less. I will point out, okay, so well, although I've got the SNP implied on this uh, prediction here, I would just caution um, electoral calculus only bases its model on the current national vote percentages of the main, uh, like, so Conservative, Labour, Lib Dem, Green Party and, and Reform UK. So it doesn't actually take account of the SNP's um, share of the votes in Scotland. So I would treat with caution the results for Plaid and the SNP because it's not even like, you know, the SNP could have their um, predicted vote share double in the polls and it would hardly filter through here at all. It wouldn't make any difference here or they could it could collapse. And it wouldn't make much difference here either. So, yeah, don't worry about what it says for the SNP. That's uh, irrelevant. Um, it's not really modelling that at all properly. It's doing, it's, or put it this way, I mean, the model itself is very rough and ready as it is, but uh, that model, such as it is, is, um, is, is totally unfit for purpose for judging the number of seats the SNP are expected to win. So we, we really don't know that. The other thing to point out as well is in terms of the share of the vote, the SNP and Labour are in a lot of flux. They do tend to vary quite a bit at the moment. I keep saying, you know, this poll gap between Labour and the Conservatives, um, you know, it looks like it's crocodile jaws at the moment, isn't it? It's, uh, but it's, you know, and it's up and down a lot, a lot. But it is also fairly stable at about 20 points. Um that's not the case for the, the vote share between Labour and the SNP in Scotland. Um, electoral calculus is very accurate in 2019. Um, yeah, I mean, the, again, YouGov's MRP model was pretty good. It was more accurate in 2017. I mean, 2017 is basically spot on. Um, 2019, it was at the upper end of their estimate. Or the Conservatives won, should we say, at the upper end. So the Conservatives did better than the median expectation, should we say. Um, uh, looking at that map, it looks like the Tories are facing a total wipeout. I mean, some of those grey, remember the greys are, some of those greys are Conservative seats. But yeah, I mean, if, you, if the Conservatives won 90 seats, that is not actually wipeout territory. territory. They can rebuild. But... 90 seats not only would set them back a, a long way there are two major problems for the conservatives as i see it first of all i mean let's say these were the results let's say the conservatives were on 90 seats and the liberal democrats were on 61 seats at that point the liberal democrats are not that far behind them and one of the main reasons that stops a lot of people who um, chime with the Liberal Democrats from voting Liberal Democrat is because they think, well, you know, we align more with the Liberal Democrats, but um, we know it's going to be the Conservatives or Labour, right? So they most people are voting for the government, so they vote that way. If they can see the Liberal Democrats as being a more worthy party and, and then looking at them and going, well, actually, the cons you know, if the Conservatives are on 90 seats, and they're going into the next election and Labour is still ahead. Let's say Labour is still well ahead of the Conservatives in, in 2029 or something, whenever the next election is, 2028, 2029. People could easily look at that and go, well, actually, the Lib Dems are just as good or better as the Conservatives will vote for them. And this is the problem the Conservatives have. It's not enough to be, I think, if they were, oblit if they were knocked down to literally like two dozen or three dozen seats, then I think they could face wipeout quite quickly. If, however, they end up on something like 90 seats, they can recover from that. The question is, will they? Because I think what is most likely to happen is they're likely to tilt, um, they're likely to tilt to the right. You know, what is trying to happen at the moment is 
there is a section of the Conservative Party that is trying to turn the Conservative Party into Reform UK. And um, and it, it it may succeed. And, and if it's beaten down to 90 seats, they've got a better chance of succeeding because they will be a large proportion. At the moment, they're not actually... They're not a majority of the Conservative Parliamentary Party. If the Parliamentary Party... 10 years ago had stood up to them and given David Cameron a backbone then they could have been dealt with by now could have been sorted dealt with finished done but that was not the case um oh just going back to the media thing there Matthew saying shutting down GB news is probably not a priority flavor I don't I don't want them shut down I don't want them shut down I just want them to follow the rules I'm quite happy for GB news to exist it just needs to follow the rules because Ofsted keep letting it get away with. Do you know what the latest thing is? Again, reasons why Ofsted letting them get away with things. So apparently when they are presenting news, their logo says GB News. When they're presenting opinion, it changes to GBN. How is anyone supposed to know that? How on earth is anyone supposed to see that subtlety? And go, oh, this must be opinion. It says GBN. Absolute nonsense. But anyway, um, two major problems with the Conservatives at the moment. So one is Sunak, but what's the second? I think I may, may have miscounted. Um, no, <laughs> I forgot what I was talking about. Oh, no, no, I meant two major problems after the election. Oh, Sunak will be gone. Forget it. Bye-bye. No, no, after the election. Um, the first major problem is that I think they're, you know, they are very likely to be tilting to the right and what that means is it particularly if labor because remember although a lot of people are basically thinking about labor oh they don't really sound like they've really got many ideas um but at least they'll be more competent you've even got i mean i was listening to a podcast again earlier today people talking to conservatives say in the city uh, and they're saying well you know uh, at least labor will be more stable and that's enough for a lot of people. But Labour have this attitude, where Streeting keeps calling it, um, under-promising and over-delivering. So Labour are loving the fact, a lot of people are complaining, well, where's the grand vision? Where's the grand vision? A vision is expensive in politics. You often do need it. It's a necessary expense, but it's an expense because the cost is that you can never, in people's minds, uh, replicate the hype. You know, so you can promise all these things and people get in their heads all these images of what it's going to mean. And then it's like, well, where is it then? So you might, for example, promise various things are going to improve in people's lives. But and they may you, you may well do it, but it may take 10 years and some places in the country may get it before others. So the ones who are, you know, still waiting after a few years uh, or even after two years, because remember, how long do you give a new government to make good on its promises? It can't achieve them all in two years. But you might only give them two years. After two years, you might decide they're not delivering because you were interested in a particular thing. They may well have delivered a lot, but it, that's the stuff you're not bothered about. The thing you were bothered about, the thing that made you vote for them, you will maybe view after two years, they haven't delivered it, and, and that's it. You then change your mind. And even if they then deliver it before the end of that parliament, that you may that party Labour may have already lost that voter. So you know voters are funny bunnies, um, you know. But the second problem the Conservatives are going to have, as I say, is if their polling remains poor because they're not appealing to enough voters, they're constantly chasing after Reform UK, then they are likely to lose a lot of money. Because although, yes, the billionaires will always want a party that's going to represent them, they also want a return on their investment. And if they're looking at the Conservatives and think, you don't know what you're doing, they're going to struggle. Um, and if the Conservatives don't have the big donations, they don't get lots of small donations. They don't get a lot of small donations from party members or other supporters. They get whacking great. They, get, they measure their donations in the millions. 
almost all of them in the millions. So um, that would be a huge problem if those ones who are not willing to donate millions if they don't think the party has a chance of winning. That could be a huge problem for them. Uh, Putting it say in theory, more don't know she's on the way out. She's looking to get in with a by-election. Happy for Kemi to be placeholder leader, IDS style post-general election. That's possible. It's entirely possible. Um, you know, Penny Mordaunt could easily, as long as she carries on playing the sort of loyal Tory, she could easily pop up somewhere else. Uh, and indeed, uh, in a by-election. Um, or just move to an area where it's likely to flip back to the Conservatives in the following election. She could play the long game if she wanted. You know, it's not like she's knocking on uh, retirement's door or anything like that. She can play a long game if she needs to. Um, she, it may even do some Tories some good to let the nutters burn. If As long as their party can survive, to let the nutters burn themselves out. Burn themselves out in the first couple of terms and then start to come back um, for when you, you can seriously rebuild. Because I don't expect the Conservative Party to start rebuilding after the election. I think they're going to carry on going in the wrong direction. I think that's quite likely. It does very much depend on that. But again, how long do they keep going in the wrong direction? Because there may come a point where what, you, what we keep calling the One Nation Tories or the more moderate Conservatives, if it goes on too long and they keep veering too far to the right and keep insisting on too much crazy, maybe there's a point at which the party does split. But what makes it difficult for the party to split is the fact that the it's like building up a party infrastructure is not easy. Like Reform UK have just got a lot of money from goodness knows where um, to build up, but they don't have the party infrastructure still. They just have like, free promotions in the media and even conservative MPs promote their ideas so you know a load of people there's Tory MPs doing Reform UK's job for them they couldn't actually have existed were it not for the media giving them attention and even the conservatives giving them attention if they'd have been treated like any other start-up party they'd be nowhere They'd be absolutely nowhere. They'd actually be lucky to be competing with UKIP right now. So um, so if a sort of moderate conservative try to form their own party, it's like, you know, can they attract their donations? Can they build up the infrastructure? It, it, you know, isn't it easier just to sit it out and wait for the crazies to burn themselves out? So although there are some conservatives who think the party could well split, I, you know, and I think it's more likely to die than to die altogether. It is very difficult um, to see the circumstances because for those circumstances to occur, the right wing would have to have permanent control. But then you think to yourself, if they lose the following election very badly as well. So, I mean, let's say they win 90 seats at the next election. But let's say at the following election they win 150. OK, that's an improvement. It's still woeful. Um, so at that point it becomes much more difficult like uh, the reason why I think they're going to tilt further to the right after the next election is because they're going to blame the One Nation Tories they're going to say you were in charge they're going to say look you had Rishi Sunak in charge you liked him he was in charge made a right arse of it now it's our turn so they will take their turn but when their turn turns to ashes then you know party members may well say you know, actually, no, you failed as well. We want to go back and try this other thing. So, you know, but all of that is dependent on do they have enough MPs to be considered a credible party? And it is the difference is you win 100 seats, you can do that. It can take them a long time to rebuild, but they can rebuild. If they only win 20 seats, they could be gone. They could be gone because what are you going to do with 20 seats? What's a, what's a party the size of the Conservative Party going to do with 20 seats? Um think the Tories are going to suffer the fate of the UUP split like they did, oddly the UUP making a bit of a comeback. Well, the UUP are the only ones being um, remotely pragmatic about things, but at the same time, not enough of a comeback potentially to save unionism. Uh, now, I want Jonathan Gullis to have a Portillo moment. Bloody hate the man. He can't have a Portillo moment because Jonathan Gullis is certain to lose his seat. He's going to lose 
and Paul, Michael Portillo was a shock. Also, I think it depends, like when people talk about the Portillo moment, there are a few nuances to it. it, depends what your focus is. First of all, it was a surprise. Second of all, he was someone who was considered quite likely to, or, or at least be in with a, a, a very credible chance of becoming the Conservative Party leader. Um, so by Michael Portillo le losing, not only was it a surprise, but it was something that potentially affected the future direction of the Conservative Party. So a Portillo moment would have to be the same thing. It would have to be a surprise and it would have to be someone who was likely to be a major influencer in the future shape of the party. So you'd be talking someone like Swella Bravman or Kemi Badnock or Liz Truss, people like that losing their seat. That would be a Portillo moment because at the moment... That's they're not likely to lose their seats. They could if people voted tactically in those seats, they could. But at the moment, you would say it's unlikely. Um, and you would also say all three of those intend to shape the future of the Conservative Party. So they're all Portillo's. Uh, Matthew saying Portillo was odds on to become Tory leader. People have been odds on to become Tory leader in the past and they haven't won. So it doesn't always work out like that. Um, you know, Michael Heseltine, I'm pretty sure, I was much younger at the time, but I'm pretty sure he was uh, odds on to, fate, to to win, to succeed Margaret Thatcher, and he did not. Um, uh, would there be the equivalent of a gang of fallout when the SDB split from Labour? Um, I mean, the other, well, the thing is, though, if you think about these so-called One Nation Tories as well, like, first of all, I don't know which ones are going to be left. They don't really have any or they don't really have many big names. If you think, if you ask even casually politically interested people to write down names of Tory MPs, they're not likely to name very many One Nation Tories. They don't really have the big personalities. That is part of their problem as well. They're, they're basically meek. You know, they're just, they're indolent, really. They just go in and, you know... They're, they're sort of, um, yes, let's do as little as possible. They have no major personalities. Almost all of the big personalities in the Conservative Party are on the far right. So it's really difficult to imagine that. Uh, Phil saying, if the Overton window continues to move to the right, so will Labour. Yes, if it did, absolutely so would Labour. But of course, with a Labour government, it has the opportunity to move to the left. That is the whole point of changing government. Um, uh, Anchor say, I'm not watching Jonathan Gullis travelling around on trains for the next 25 years. Well, I didn't watch Michael Portillo do that either. Uh, I don't really watch telly and I haven't for some time. Um, IDS is the prize. I don't know. He's a has-been now. He's a has-been. He was a has-been before he even started, really, wasn't he? Um, yeah I'll be swilling champagne if Kemi loses hers would be so sweet I mean I will I will cheer major losses like that because I mean it is a funny one because you could say to yourself as a Labour supporter isn't it helpful if the Conservatives maintain unelectability it helps Labour um, not have to like if Labour can maintain a decent lead in the polls, they will panic less and therefore they'll be more focused on delivering what they need to deliver and less concerned about headlines and all the rest of it. And absolutely, yes. I just worry that the impact on the public, um, you know, I was I did a podcast for someone else's channel, which I'll, I'll promote once I know when it's being uploaded. Um, and one of the things I said, you know, he was asking... Well, actually, this may not be in the podcast. This may be an extra. But he was asking what's needed to basically improve politics, to, to remove the divisiveness within society. You never remove divisiveness within politics, of course, but within society, at least. And, um, you know, he suggested electoral reform and a better quality of politician. And I agreed you need both. It's, it's electoral reform in itself is not enough. You need a better quality of politician. And while the Conservatives may re remain unelectable, 
the fact that they will still be getting a platform in the mainstream. Remember, Swella Bravman is going to be a Daily Telegraph columnist. Uh, unless you become, I mean, presumably she'll try and become lead and then she'd probably have to stop. Or maybe she won't. I don't know. Um, you know, so she's going to be platforming herself. It's not just that the Daily Telegraph are going to be going, oh, Swella Bravman said an interesting thing. Let's write a piece about it. She's going to write the piece herself. So she's going to be poisoning our politics regardless. But she will be taken more seriously as an MP than an ex-MP. And the same with Kemi Badnock. So all of these people suddenly become less useful if they're not even in Parliament. I mean, I think David Frost is probably only being taken seriously at the moment because of two things. First, his association with Boris Johnson. And second, that he is still in Parliament, albeit in the House of Lords, he's never been anywhere near the House of Commons. Um, Gullis would walk into uh, would walk uh, into a panto job he, he's not very good at remembering his lines so I don't think he would he could maybe be the guy that throws the crisps into the audience maybe that if he hasn't eaten them all first I wonder how many MPs will end up talking through their financial difficulties and completing a budget to find out how they repay their debt well I mean, I have no sympathy because, for you know, I have sympathy for some people who get into financial difficulties. But with Conservative MPs, for two reasons, I would have zero sympathy. I might have sympathy for their families, but not them. The first is that the Conservatives keep blathering on about how when people are in difficulty, genuine difficulty, that's no fault of theirs. It's because they're not very good at budgeting. They're not very good at handling their money. Well, it's like, well, OK, the shoe's on the other foot now. You deal with your own problems. And the second reason, of course, is being a politician, being an MP, should be seen as um, very unstable work. Yes, there are MPs who, once they're selected as their party's candidate, and if they've got a good relationship with the local constituency party and it's a nice, safe seat for their party, yeah, there's plenty of them can probably look ahead to, if they start young, 40, 50 years in Parliament, sure, whatever. Um, but they shouldn't expect it. They should not expect it. But, you know, so because if you do, if you're an MP and you're thinking to yourself, oh, yeah, I've got uh, easy, easy. I'm going to be MP for the next 20, 30 years. What that says to me is you're not taking your voters seriously. You should treat every election, every the following election as if, if you don't persuade the voters that you are worth voting for, they won't vote for you. And again, that's the problem with our system, that that doesn't always happen. So I have no sympathy because they shouldn't have taken their seat, for their continued um, you know, uh, role as an MP for granted. And also, they're very rude about people who face financial difficulties. So, you know, I tend to have less sympathy for people who find themselves in difficulties that they have where where they have no sympathy for others in the same situation do i think lifelong tourists like ken clark say do rc who distance themselves a lot from their own party will keep making life difficult for the mainstream tory party they will keep expressing their views i mean this is the thing with putting someone in the house of lords it's quite funny because often one of the big this is why the house of lords is really popular even within labor right because the House of Lords is a brilliant place to hide your skeletons. The number of times that you stop an MP from making a big fuss about something, causing trouble or blabbing about something, by offering them some honour, um, and of course the highest honour is a seat in the House of Lords, right? So it's often used um, you know, for that purpose. But it's um the, the the downside to it is once you've conferred that honor because it's for life and you have no power to change it uh, once you've given it then they're free to say what they like so yeah ken clark michael Hesseltine, well see every all the rest of them that want to they are perfectly free to say they don't have to consider uh electoral reality they can say exactly what they think they can if they're 
if they if they're the sort of people who like being honest they can be as honest as they like I uh, can't believe that Harriet Baldwin is nominated by Sunak for a Dame Hood. What has she done to deserve that? What have any of them done to deserve it? That's the problem. But then I always also say about knighthoods and other honours. Um, I mean, let's be clear about what our honours system is. We think it's for deserving people, but historically it's not, is it? Knighthoods were basically conferred by the king to people who were good at basically beating up peasants and, and enemy nobles for the king. You know, it, it was a title given effectively to um, you know, murderers, really. So there's nothing like, there's nothing noble about it. And as for like OBEs and MBEs and KBEs, the BE stands for British Empire. So, you know, I was, I was, I was doing on the Labour Social yesterday. I would just scrap the whole honour system. I'd get rid I'd like anyone who's got an MBE or a knighthood or something like that, let them keep it. I'm not saying take it away. Let them keep it. They'll die out eventually. It'll disappear. But don't confer any new ones. Scrap that system. End it. Create an entirely new honours system, which politicians do not appoint or recommend. Have a, a separate, like parliament, a cross-party group of MPs, not the government, a cross-party group of MPs, can uh, create the guidelines for conferring honours, but the honours decided by lay people. That means non-politicians. So you have an honours committee with zero politicians on it, uh, and they decide. They take you know recommendations from the public, and they then decide. Not and in fact, actually have it that MPs are not allowed to recommend. Specifically, ban them from recommending them not just remove their power to confer them. I would, you know, there might be one exception. I mean, most countries do have a really, really high honour for like gallantry. You might have like a sort of a George Cross type thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the government can confer those because the understanding will be that it is, f and even then there will be guidelines for it. Um, and the understanding, therefore, will be that it will be very rarely given out. In a typical year, zero will be given out. It is for, you know, incredible heroism. Um, things like that, you know, so but but mostly take the system away from politicians. Then we may get more deserving people get them. We may then get more deserving people. Um Uh, parcel there saying it used to know members of Harlow Labour, Labour Party who were shocked how many working class people had gone blue I suppose there were lots of council houses to tell. I mean I keep I keep saying my fiance's mother who so when my fiance was young and she was voting for the very first time she went with her mother and her mother this is illegal by the way but her mother stood over her to make sure she voted Labour so she was a Labour supporter working class woman Labour supporter and then she bought her council house. And after that, she has voted Conservative ever since. And this is the thing. This is what this is one of the madnesses of the Conservative Party. The way they create voters is what you need is for people to feel the benefits of capitalism. You know, even if they're not really benefiting, they have to feel that they are. And, and the main way in which you benefit is home ownership. Because if you get a mortgage in your 20s, you'll struggle. Everyone struggles in their 20s unless they, you know, got a silver spoon in their mouth. But most people struggle in their 20s anyway. So why not struggle with a mortgage rather than renting? Then in your 30s, it gets a bit easier. Not only because your wages are going up, like you're climbing the career ladder. I don't just mean wages going up with like the annual increase. Uh, hopefully with inflation, but not recently. But I mean, just climbing the career ladder, getting better paid positions or going up the pay scale. Um, so in your 30s, it's more manageable because your mortgage is still basically the same. It only goes up with interest rates. Then in your 40s, not only might you be coming towards the end of that mortgage term, but it's now next to nothing. You know, whereas the same person who got the mortgage at the same time could now be paying four or five as times as much for rent. So the person in their 40s who didn't get the mortgage, 
who isn't a homeowner, they have potentially a lower standard of living now than they did in their 20s. So they're not going to vote Conservative. That is why there are fewer people going to... There is a smaller percentage of voters going to vote Conservative in this election than did in 1997. Because they're being completely screwed over. Because the Conservatives don't understand that this single... You would think the most important policy area for Conservatives is housing. They need as many homeowners as possible. Because those are the people then in their 40s start to think I've got a few quid, I've got some disposable income, I'm starting to enjoy the good life, can put some savings aside. Oh, all of a sudden I now care about taxes. And um, so, yeah, it's an absolute madness. The Conservatives should prioritise housing. The fact that they have allowed, you know, homeowners to struggle or, or sorry, aspiring homeowners to struggle to be able to get onto the housing ladder is insane absolutely insane but there we go uh, there is an application form to nominate anyone for honors uh, the fact that people don't use it to nominate ordinary people is more of a problem there is yes and many people are given honors based on that but what i mean is politicians should not be allowed to confer them because it's almost always corrupt and i am not just talking about the conservative party here think about the people who mostly get honors donors getting honors bang out of order I'll tell you, do you know what's interesting? Someone came up with something interesting recently. So during the entire time that Labour were in government last time, I think it was something like they gave 11 sitting MPs knighthoods. 11 MPs got knighthoods during Labour's 13 years in power. In the Conservatives' 14 years in power, it's over 100 knighthoods given to mps what does that tell you it tells you that the, i mean they were some of them are given they're given for rewards they're rewards it's really all there is to it granted okay there are some things you may say you know if i mean oh okay if someone served as an mp for 40 years and then they retire uh, i mean you probably put them in the house of lords rather than give them a knighthood but you give them something you will give them something uh, your, or your party will say, look, they should have something 40 years service, um, even if other people may not think they've served. But, you know, no one would criticise that. Uh, you know, if Labour gave out 11 under Blair and Brown, then how do the Conservatives give out over 100 in, in basically the same time frame? So, um, you know, they, and, and, and as I say, it's the same thing. You do it for favours. You know, oh, support me for this. I'll see you right. Um, or keep quiet about this. I'll see you right. You'll get. You'll be getting a nice little honour. You might even end up with a seat in the House of Lords. So you know, we should. That's why we should just get rid of it all. Get rid of the unelected House of Lords. Get rid of politically appointed honours. Get rid of them. Remove that corruption. Because it doesn't actually help. Like, and I'll say that even within Labour, it doesn't help Labour at all to have um, a situation where the leader or a senior member of the leadership can promise an honour in return for support for something. Um, that doesn't help the Labour Party. Uh, how can the honour system be expanded to give more war veterans and soldiers the recognition they deserve besides the Victoria Cross? So, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a military person, so I don't know about that. Um, in all honesty, I, mean, I would have thought the best way you can honour veterans is by making sure that they have access to a decent standard of living when they've they've uh, left the military. Isn't that better? You know, rather than giving them a, a bit of metal, actually make sure, and I mean make sure that they have access to good quality um, health care, including mental health care, in case PTSD is an issue. Make sure that they've got access to decent quality jobs. Make sure they decent quality housing. You know, that is the best way to honour veterans in my view. But I'm not a military person. If anyone wants, you know, if there's a, if there's a different, like, honour system specifically for them, that can be for other people to discuss. Uh, I'm saying it's a bit of a joke. Instead of saying something's bang out of order, I say uh, B-nag. Literally the word bang, bang spelled out of order. Yeah, it's very good. 
Um, at least the PM doesn't have the pardon power like the US. I mean, no, and it's not expected. The problem is in the US, not only does the president have that power, but they're expected to use it. They literally pardon people when they leave office. It's like that's a mad. So it's like it's expected. Find criminals and say they're no longer criminals. It's like that's mad. Um, I mean, it's one thing to have the power to sort of circumvent. Uh, circumvent justice uh, well I don't really mean that do I but the, the, the justice system if someone who's clearly innocent um, needs you know needs pardoning or something like that but or or where there was a miscarriage of justice but you know yeah yeah so at least they don't have that I mean at the moment pardoning or however they're going to do it the postmasters um, that is taking parliament that is parliament getting involved there uh, Sunak can't just decree it. Uh, the honour system, the gold watch, the Conservative Party decided by Tories, paid for by you. I mean, the cost is neither here nor there for me. It's the political cost. It's the fact that it's covering corruption. Because I look, you know, there are some people and you just think, do you know what? You've given service in this thing and you've got an honour for it. And I think that's absolutely fine. Um, you know, if, for example, you've served in cabinet for like 10 years, and you get an MBE, fine, sure, okay. Um, you know, if you've been the Prime Minister and you get a knighthood, yeah, sure, or even in the House of Lords. If you've served in Parliament for 30 years and you end up in the House of Lords, okay, right. Um, but when you look at some people and you go, they've done nothing, and, you know, it's not even like a political, I'm not even saying... Um, you know, you've pushed thing, you've pushed bad policies because that's a political point of view. But if they've literally done nothing, it's like, well, what worth have you been? Like, take Gavin Williamson, now Sir Gavin Williamson. What did he do? He became the defence secretary that was sacked by Theresa May for betraying his country. Now, I said at the time, I'm not convinced about the evidence there. It's possible he was scapegoated. But nonetheless, he was sacked for basically betraying his country letting his country down then he became education secretary under boris johnson and presided over a complete shambles of a situation with the award uh the, the grade awarding during the pandemic which ended up with a load of private school kids getting easy top grades and because teachers in normal schools guy was one of them were taking the whole thing seriously you know, massively incent it massively um, inflated the grades of private schools, uh, private school pupils over like state schools, and they were going to. I mean, you know, they were going to completely screw over state school kids or state college kids. So yeah, absolute nightmare. Uh, he he's you know how does he deserve a knighthood? How his his career in politics is one of failure. He, he was basically sacked twice from cabinet for being hideously incompetent. You know, Ian Duncan Smith. Ian Duncan Smith gets a knighthood. What does he get a knighthood for? He was Tory leader and didn't even last one parliament. And, and as a minister, I mean, for goodness sake, what did he do? Like, even if you, you take away the politics and you... You know, you don't say, oh, he, he, he did bad things because maybe you think he did good things. But what did he do? What did he actually achieve? He didn't actually achieve anything. He, he, tr he set out to do things, but he didn't get them done. So why has he got a knighthood? Why has Jacob Rees-Mogg got a knighthood? What did he do at all? Nothing. Say so Boris, <laughs> Boris's hairdresser went above and beyond for a seat in the House of Lords. Yeah, providing all those balloons to comb his hair. Is it just possible that people misunderstand the current political game? None of the large parties will have exactly what we want. The point is to get as much as we can until we can achieve PR. Well, I mean, yeah, we need a more proportional system. Even then, I mean, politics, right, politics is never, ever, ever going to be well respected. You know, it's like at the moment they're saying uh, politics is at a low. It's a record low since polling began. Um, there's about like 10% of people have faith in politicians in Westminster specifically. Uh, and it was a high during Labour's last period in government. But then it was like 20 odd. It was like 28 or something, maybe or 20 something 
It's not exactly high, is it? And it never will be. But the more representative you make it, the more satisfied people will be. It's really that simple. You need a system where people feel they're represented. And you know, the way I look at it is you've got... So think about the electorates. Think about what roughly 32 million people voted at the last general election, right? There's about, what, what would you say, about a million people, no more than a million people in this country are members of political parties, I would argue. I would suggest there's no more than a million that are members of political parties, and it's probably well short of that. And 32 million voters. So clearly the vast majority of voters are not party political because they don't want to join a political party. And yet the majority of vo the clear vast majority of voters vote either Labour or the Conservatives. Well, that's that's that can't be because, you know, if you've got let me look at the exact figures now. I actually just want to finish off with this. Let's look at the exact figures. Um, how many voted for Labour and the Conservatives? Uh, so about 40 million there. 24 and a bit million. 24 and a bit million out of, I think, 32 million uh, votes. But I can't find that exactly. Um, so, the you know, the, what are we saying? Uh, over two thirds voted Labour or the Conservatives. But the the number of members in each of those parties like between them they've got like what half a million members maybe a bit more at the time of 2019 uh, maybe 600,000 between them and you think well you know 24 million 24 million voted for one of those two parties but only about 600,000 wants to be a member of them so most of them are clearly voting Labour because they don't want the Conservatives or they're voting the Conservatives because they don't want Labour. <laughs> so we need a much more um, proportional system. But then again, there we go. We've run out of time, I'm afraid, uh, again. Uh, thanks very much for coming on, everyone. Have a very good evening. And until next time, I'll see you later.